So we're going to jump into uh, Matthew. You saw the overview that I sent out to you guys. Uh, tonight, we're going to be in the first section, and we're going to do an expository teaching in that first section. Uh, before they do, I do that, we're going to kind of set it up. But Sarah, thank you very much. Didn't the team do a great job tonight, guys? We love them. So who, who knows what Matthew's occupation was before he became a disciple? Raise your hand right here. Tax collector, right? Now, you know, I know in our day and age, uh, the IRS is one of the most liked people we have in our society. <laughs> They're not too like now, are they? Well, back then it was even worse because Matthew, the Romans were using him to uh, really oppress the Jewish people because Matthew was Jewish. And it would use the Jewish people to collect taxes because the Romans, they didn't know everyone, their language barriers and all this kind of stuff. So they would get someone who was willing, to be honest with you, to kind of sell your people out. And he kind of sold his people out and was, was really collecting these taxes on, on all of the, his brothers and sisters, on his family, uh, on the Hebrew people. And so he's collecting. So he was not really a like person more than likely. Uh, among the Jewish people, yet Jesus saw potential in him. And it's awesome because when Jesus called Matthew uh, to follow him, Matthew dropped what he was doing and decided to follow him. So Matthew would have been a wealthy person. Uh, he would have had a nice house. I mean, so Matthew didn't just, you know, some of the fishermen he called, uh, their, their homes and what they left was probably, you know, some of them were like, Oh, all this hard work? Absolutely. I'm with you, Jesus. But Matthew, man, was living a good life, at least in the world's eyes, and he was willing to walk away from all that. So that's a big deal when you think about Matthew. Uh, but Matthew, not only when he followed Jesus, he, he innately understood something else that, hey, this man in which I have met, in which I have experienced, my people that I hang out with need to meet him. And Matthew actually threw a party at his house, and he had all the, the sinners and, and all the other tax collectors, and everyone came over to his house so that they could meet Jesus Christ. Man, what a great example of the way when we come to the Lord, how we should introduce people to Jesus. By the way, if you ever are in a place where, man, I want to get all of my family together and, or my friends together together. And I just want them to hear about who the Lord really is. Man, call them together and tell them who he really is. If you're not comfortable with that, call the office and we'll have someone that is comfortable with sharing the gospel with them to tell them. Don't trick them. Just say, hey, you know, I got I met a man, Jesus Christ, in a real way. And if y'all are willing, I'd like you to just hear who he is. If you would come over and you'd be surprised who will come over when you make it about meeting Jesus not about coming to our church. You'll be amazed how many people that really want to meet Jesus. Amen? So I want to encourage you to do that uh, if you so are led by the Holy Spirit to do that. Now, Matthew, when he laid out you know, his gospel, the first thing I want you to realize is Israel had a deliverer uh, in the beginning uh, kind of not the beginning, but yeah, I guess the first deliverer in their history was who? Who was he? Moses. So Moses was the first deliverer that God sent into Egypt to pull Israel out of Egypt. So Jesus is coming and he is the deliverer that they think is about pulling them away from Rome. But it was a lot different than they thought, wasn't it? But I want you to see the parallels. And so the parallel between Moses and Jesus Christ, Pharaoh killed babies to get to Moses. The devil, the Pharaoh didn't even know about Moses. He was just killing babies. And, but it was the devil saying, I, man, this baby is, is going to be mighty, and I need to take him out. So he, he had the ruler uh, go out and start killing babies. Of course, the mother hid Moses, and you all know the story. Well, same thing, Herod killed babies to get to Jesus. I want you to see the parallel of the deliverer here, all right? So he killed, and he was actually directly after Jesus. 
Because the wise men had come and told him that the, the you know, king of the, of the Jews had been born. And he was in, you know, where? And they looked in the scriptures, they found where. And so he went after and tried to kill Jesus. And the angel actually got Joseph up and said, you got to get your family out of here. So the other thing was Moses came out of Egypt. All right, he came out of Egypt. And guess what? Jesus Christ came out of where? Egypt. That's where he went when he left. And the angel said, you got to get out of here. That's where he went. He went to Egypt. Moses was baptized in the Red Sea. And it, it's actually in the New Testament. It says that was a form of baptism. Moses came to the Red Sea where Jesus Christ was baptized in the Jordan. Now, there's a difference there. The Red Sea was about coming out of bondage, where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, uh, which represents going into the promises. Can I get an amen? So you see that. Moses fasted 40 days. Actually, Moses ended up fasting 80 days. He fasted 40, and then the people acted corruptly and built a golden calf and called it God, and uh, he had to come down and deal with all that. Then he went back up for another 40 days. So he was actually fasted for 80 days, but he fasted for 40 days to get the law. And then Jesus Christ also fasted 40 days in the wilderness. Moses received the 10 commandments on the mountain and Jesus Christ delivered the spiritual law from the sermon on the mountain. You see the parallels here? Moses delivered the people from slavery from Pharaoh, Jesus Christ delivered the people from the what? Slavery of sin. That was more important that they would be delivered from sin. You see, Moses was more dealing with the physical. Jesus is more dealing with the spiritual. Moses brought the people into covenant, which is the first covenant with the Lord. But Jesus Christ brought the people into a new covenant and a better covenant. And that covenant, of course, is found in the Old Testament and the New Testament. By the way, if, if you read the Old Testament, all of it, you realize that when you're reading the books in the New Testament, what they were reading when they wrote the letter to the churches. Because it it's so syncs up, it, it really is an amazing thing. But the new covenant that we have with God is that I would write my law in their hearts instead of on just stone. I'm going to write it on their hearts. So instead of them coming from the external, I'm going to do it on the internal. I'm going to write it on their heart, and I'm going to put it in their mind. And they do that because you were made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And so in the, he writes it on our heart. And so when we get saved, we've got a Bible app that's downloaded. Can I get an amen? And it's in our heart. But then by study and waking up and doing your spiritual disciplines and reading the scriptures, you're renewing your mind. And and that's what he's talking about. And he said, I would be their God and that they would be my children. And so we become a part of the family. How do we know we say? Because the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so he said, no longer would anyone have to teach his neighbor or his brother to know me for all should know me from the least to the greatest of them. And so it's not this hierarchy where, you know, someone with money and prestige is the only ones that can really have access to God. And they're the only ones that can, they need to teach all the lower people about who God is. He said, it's not going to be that way. Everyone's going to have the opportunity to know me because it's going to be by my spirit that I draw them and it's going to be by my spirit that I saved them through the name of Jesus Christ and accepting what he is, who he is and what he did on the cross. And it's going to be by my spirit that I teach them and that I help them. And then he said, and we talked about this past week. How about this past week, guys? Your sins and your lawless deeds will be remembered no more. Wow. Remembered no more. By the way, who, who appreciated this past weekend's experience and message from the Lord? Amen of the forgiveness of God. That was just pure grace of the Lord. Well, you do not, do not, look at your neighbor and say, you do not <clears throat> want to miss this weekend, starting tomorrow night. Starting tomorrow night. So if you're going to be 
you know, uh, gone this weekend, as far as Saturday, Sunday and all that, come tomorrow night. You don't want to miss, tomorrow night is so weighty, it is so weighty and, and so encouraging, I'm, I'm telling you, it's just people are going to be frozen. I did it with a creative team, uh, Cindy, Pastor Joey, Sarai, Sarah, the different ones, are, Pastor Terry, where you at, Pastor Terry? And uh, when, we, when we went over this message on, on Tuesday, or Monday, it was actually Monday, uh, did it impact you guys? I'm telling you, this, this is this message from the Lord. This is actually forgiveness part two, but it's going to, it's going to blow your mind. But it's going to get us in a place of great freedom. Can I get an amen? amen. So you don't, you don't want to miss that at all. You really don't. Uh, so this is the better covenant that we have that Jesus brought to us. Now, when you go to Matthew, what I want to focus on is the Beatitudes. All right, so the Beatitudes... Uh, means blessedness or the state of the utmost bliss. That's what it actually means. Blessedness or the state of the utmost bliss. I mean, in other words, this is living a good life. Beatitudes, think of this, beatitudes. A Christian should have this attitude. So the attitude that a Christian should be is what Jesus unloads in the Sermon on the Mountain. But this is about living the blessed. Who wants to live a blessed life? You see, I want you to understand something. You can have life and not live a blessed life. Come on, this don't take rocket science. You can just look around. People can be saved but never live the blessed life. Children of Israel came out of Israel, but a lot of them never left the wilderness. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people in Christianity that never leave the wilderness. They never cross the Jordan. They never get to the blessedness of what God had for them. That's why Jesus explained, I didn't come to just give life, but life more abundantly. Or you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and it talks about, you know, uh, your works are going to be tested by fire. And, and he actually says, he says, you know, if your works are all burned up, it didn't amount to anything. He said, you'll be saved, but in your life, you'll have great loss. I'm, I'm, you know, it breaks my heart when I see people saved, but they never learn the blessedness in the state of the utmost bliss of, of really living out the teachings of Jesus Christ. Coming not from Mount Sinai, but coming from the mountain that Jesus stood on to bring us the new way we should live, the teachings that if we follow them, would utterly change our life so that we would live the good life. Now, who wants to live the good life? <clears throat> Some people, they say, well, I just want to get to heaven. Wow. First of all, you're shooting real low on earth. And secondly, you don't realize what you're missing. Thirdly, you think that's going to be pleasing to the Lord. So, no, the Lord... He didn't do all this so we wouldn't take advantage of it. He did all this so we would take advantage of all that he has to offer. Amen? Amen. But it starts with understanding how we ought to live our lives in the Beatitudes that he unpacks for us. And so we're going to do a little expository and walk through this. So it starts in Matthew 5, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he had sat down... His disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. So right here, you know, you need, we need to be taught. All of us need to continue to have a, a learner spirit. Can I get an amen? But he opened his mouth, and he taught. Jesus was not quiet when he taught. He actually said he sat down, and that was the custom of a rabbi. A rabbi... You know, when I see, you know, sometimes I went through, you know, different uh, seasons of, you know, sitting or at a table, or whatever, and I had people mad because I'm sitting and not standing. They wouldn't like any of the rabbis because the rabbis would sit down and they would teach from a sitting position. So he would sit and he would teach, but he had to be pretty loud 
because he didn't have the microphone on his face like I have. And he was talking to a lot more people than I'm talking to right now. And so he was not a mild-mannered reporter. Can I get an amen? He, he had to open his mouth and loudly exclaim the teachings of God so that people just practically can hear him. And you know that he had passion. He wasn't, you know, just monotone. He had incredible passion. Even the, the people of Israel said, wow, he does not talk like the normal teachers talk. He comes with authority. He speaks with authority. And then you go to the New Testament, it says, if you're going to speak the oracles of God, speak them with authority. Because they are the oracles of God. Amen? So he, he sat down and he set them down just like you are to learn and to grow. And he starts out in the first one, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the word poor here is not talking about uh, like I can't afford my house. I, I don't have money to go get groceries. I don't have money to pay my light bill. It's not the physical poverty he's talking about. This is where he's, this poor means to be bankrupt. So it means to be bankrupt in your spirit. It means to come to a place where you know you're lacking and that you need something else. That's how I ended up getting saved. I wasn't in a problem, you know, and there's nothing wrong with people who get in issues and getting problems or end up in jail or they're going through something traumatic or all this. You know, I was, I, all my needs were met. I had a roof over my head. I had all this stuff. But I just knew that, hey, something's missing. I, I, I am, and that's what I was, I was poor in spirit. I knew I, I needed something else. And he said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you got to recognize that we have a need for God. And that's what he's talking about, being poor in spirit. Then he said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So mourning here, if you think about it, is those once you realize, wow, I am lacking and I am bankrupt in my spirit and I don't measure up to the things of God, then what that causes, that causes sorrow, but not a sorrow to destroy you. It's a sorrow to lead us to repentance. And you go to the book of James and it says, it actually, in the book of James, it explains what repentance is. It says, howl and cry and fall on your face because of your sin. And so when you pour in spirit, it just leads you to the next place where, man, I realize how messed up I am. And you start crying to God. You, you start realizing, man, God, I, I've sinned against you, God. I, I have not measured up, oh God. And he said, when you come in that way, you're, that's a broken and a contrite spirit. Contrite meaning that uh, I'm, I'm super sorrowful for my sins, but it's a sorrow that leads you to repentance. They call it a godly sorrow. There's a, a sorrow that leads to, to just feeling bad, but there's a sorrow that leads to repentance, and that's the godly sorrow. And so when you pour in spirit and all of a sudden you realize how you've not measured up and the things you've done in your life, you are broken. And when you are broken and you come to God broken like that, the Lord says, I will not refuse you. And literally, I will comfort you. I am going to comfort you. And you're going to experience what I preached this past weekend of that shame and that guilt and that condemnation coming off of you. Can I get an amen? So blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for the Lord God is there with me to what? Comfort me. His rod and his staff, they will comfort me. So God will comfort you when you're going through that broken state because that's who he is and that's what he does. It says, blessed are the gentle, or another translation would be meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
So he's, he's moving. He's saying, okay, the kingdom of heaven, you know, it's, it's going to be yours. I'm going to comfort you. And now he's getting to, once you've dealt with yourself and God, now if you are meek, you're going to inherit the earth. I'm going to give you this place. The earth is the Lord's and all therein. And he gives it to who he wants to give it to. And he says, so if you are meek, I'm going to give it to you. Now, what does that mean to be meek, to be gentle? It doesn't mean that we're walking around timid. It actually is an example. The best example, uh, I believe, is the example of a wild horse and a broke horse. See, a wild horse and a meek horse, a gentle horse. A wild horse has strength, it has stamina, it has a agility, but it's not useful because it's not submitted to nothing. So what is a, a gentle horse, a broke horse, is a horse that has the same power, the same, the same stamina, the same uh, agility, yet he submitted to the master. And that's what the Lord says. I don't want you acting like wild animals. Where you think you just go do what you want. And you can use the strength I've given you. That I made you. And the way I made you. And you're just going to use it to how you think you need to use it. He said, that's not, that's not the kingdom of heaven. That's not... That's not what my kingdom is about, my kingdom is about coming to the Lord and submitting yourself to the Lord. Where you are broken. That word broken does not mean spirit. A horse, you don't break a horse's spirit, you break a horse's will. You want a horse to have the spirit, but you break the will so that they no longer follow their will, but they follow yours. See, uh, uh, a wild horse thinks it's free, yet it's bound by everything around it. Where a yielded horse that's submitted to the master is useful to the master. See, a wild horse can only go where its feet can bring him. And then he's, he's, he's hemmed in by his environment of how far he's going to go. Well, the broke horse goes wherever the master brings him. And he didn't even have to walk to get there. He gets a ride. Can I get an amen? amen. You know, the, the wild horse that won't submit thinks everything's great when the land has got plenty of food and water. But guess what? When the land is not producing and it's a famine, it's a drought, guess what? That horse that thinks it's free is suffering. Yeah. Maybe even will die. Well, the broke horse that's submitted to the master is going, I ain't worried about no famine or drought. My master feeds me. I, I need water. All I got to do is go to the water trough, and there it is. I ain't got to worry about none of that. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? You see, the wild horse won't even let anything on it. So it's not even useful. The broke horse, when it gets in a situation or circumstance, instead of reacting with fight or flight, the broke horse goes to the next thing where it doesn't go fight or flight, but it actually goes, what's the master want? So when it comes across a situation, instead of reacting like a wild horse would react, it will actually wait and see what the master on its back look up to see what the master wants it to do. And so... Because, he goes, I can trust my master because I know he's going to get me out of this. Because the master may say, just be still. Be still and know that I am God. The master may say, back up. The master may say, step left, step right. The master may say, let's get out of here. <laughs> but the point is, this is not, this is about your strength, your abilities, everything God's given to you, submit it to God. Oh, and when it's submitted to God, 
God said, I'll take you places that your feet will never carry you. Come on, someone. Come on, can we give the Lord a hand clap for that? Then he goes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they would be satisfied. And I want to stop here because a lot of people will come into a service like this or on, on the weekend services or anywhere they're going to a conference or wherever it is and or even opening their Bible in the morning. And they're like, okay, God, move me. Move me, God. And they're disappointed when God doesn't move them. Because that's not how it works. It works when we come in and we move him. That we're hungry and thirsty for more of him. And he says, when you are hungry and thirsty for more of him, Guess what? You're going to be satisfied by him. So in the morning, if you're like, okay, God, you know, you're going to move me or what? You probably will be disappointed. But if you open the scriptures like, man, God, show me something, Lord. And you're looking and you're seeking for it. You shall find it. God, I need you to do something. You're knocking. It will open. Can I get an amen? amen? And so you got a hunger and thirst for God. You know, Casey, you're a great fisherman. Casey can catch a bass in a mud hole in the parking lot. <clears throat> Casey, if you're fishing and you, you're trying to uh, get a fish, but the fish is full, it's not interested in the bait, right? It's not going to, it's, it's just going to watch it go by. Well, when we fill up ourselves with so much of the world, God can bring his delicacies in front of us and we just lift our nose up to it because we don't have any room for that which is heavenly. If we filled ourselves with all those things that are earthly. So let's make sure that we're filling ourselves and leaving room for the things that are heavenly. Amen? Amen. That we're not filling ourselves with all this other stuff, you know, constantly, constantly, all this other stuff. Well, then you're not going to hunger for the, the word of the Lord. Because you're eating junk food. You're eating junk food that eventually is going to destroy you. Instead of eating the healthy spiritual food of God, that's going to enhance you. He says, if you hunger and thirst for me, I will satisfy you. So if you're not satisfied with your Christianity, whose fault is that? It's on us. Because God always does his part. So if you're, if you're like, man, I'm just not satisfied. Well, then get hungry. Get hungry. Get thirsty for the things of God, to be around the things of God, to be around in the house of God, to be around when people, you know, are, 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 are talking about God, to, to look and, and start witnessing about what God has done in your life and, and be hungry for it, be, be driven by it, live by it. When the alarm clock goes off, instead of, you know, searching for human breakfast, search for heavenly breakfast. Can I get an Amen. Get hungry for him, and you will be satisfied anytime. And look, sometimes that means you just got to, you got to stir yourself. The Bible talks about stirring yourself. Sometimes I, I just stir myself and say, well, okay, come on, get up. Get up here, soul. I need to hunger for my God. You got to stir yourself. Quit allowing your emotions to control you, and you start controlling your emotions. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Satisfied. If you're not satisfied, then get hungry, and you will be satisfied. 
because God will do it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, mercy is when someone's done you something wrong and you choose to not pay them back for their wrong. That's mercy. Mercy is when you might deserve one thing, but I'm not going to give you what you deserve. And thank God for that. That's good. Thank God for that. Because we all deserve hell and death. We all deserve to be separated from God. Listen to me. The last thing you want is justice. You want mercy. Let God deal with the justice stuff. You deal with the mercy. Because if you give mercy, you're going to receive mercy. So it's very important to understand this, guys, and to embrace this mercy, giving people mercy, not giving people what they deserve, giving people mercy. And we're only going to do that if we walk in love. Amen. And as we walk in love, we'll give people mercy. What's greater, judgment or mercy? The Bible says mercy is greater than judgment. Greater than judgment. And so that's the meat. The meat is when you can be done wrong and still love them anyway. When you've been done wrong and you can still hope for the best for them anyway. That's walking in the mercy of God, which Jesus says we're called to walk in. He says because when you live that way. The root of bitterness won't come in and start messing with you. Let me tell you something. Unforgiveness and, and bitterness and offenses and all that, look, it'll destroy you. You're sitting there moping in all this, thinking that somehow in your moping and, and wallowing in the, all this misery that it's going to affect the other person. That's like eating rat poison and expecting the other person to die. Give it to the Lord. The Lord knows how to. The Lord said, vengeance is mine, not yours. For you, you do good. I will deal with that. That's not for you to deal with. Amen? Amen. We need to remember that. If we want to live the blessed life, who wants to live the blessed life? Okay. Blessed are the pure at heart. For they will see God. They will see God. So the pure at heart is when, man, uh, we have an ambition to please God. We're real with God. We're honest with God. And and the things we do are are intent. Because the word of God actually says we'll penetrate bone and marrow so that what? Can someone tell me? So he can reveal the intentions of our soul. And so God wants us to have pure intentions. He wants us to to be pure with him, to be honest with him, to be real with him, and to be real with ourselves. Being pure at heart, being just being honest about things. And I'm telling you, when you when you live that way and you talk to God that way, God talks to you. Because you'll see God. Because here's the thing. He knows it anyway. I mean, do we really think we can hide anything from God? Isn't he all knowing? So it's better to just be real with him. Exactly where you're at. That's why when I uh, do my expressive writing, I'll, I'll just express my raw emotion to God. And it would be not biblical what I'm feeling. <laughs> God, I want to whack that person. I just want to, like David prayed, I want, to, I want to tear their guts out and bear them in a hole and let the worms eat them. I mean, that's how David was playing, right? And so, God, I, I kind of feel that way. And, but then I, then I go, but I know that's not right. So, Holy Spirit, I need your help to get right. See, God wants you to be real with that. He don't want you to hide it or stick it under a rug. 
I'm telling you, when you just come to God and you're real about it, you're going to see God. And you're going to see God move in your life in amazing ways when you become just raw and real with God. He knows anyway. It's not like you're going to stay in that state, but you've got to be honest with that state so you can move to the right state. Can I get an amen? And that comes with being honest and pure and being pure at heart with the Lord. Then the next one says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. All right, a peacemaker means there wasn't peace, but when you were inserted into the situation, you brought peace. You wasn't someone who stirred things up. But you are someone who helped settle things down. And so the idea that he says you need to be a peacemaker, he understood that we'd be in circumstances and situations in our life where there wasn't peace, there was turmoil. But he's saying my sons and daughters, wherever they are at, are going to be, I'm going to insert them in so that they can bring a peaceful solution. So they're going to be peacemakers, not trouble stirrers. I want them to be peacemakers. All of us need to work on when someone talks to us about something and they're upset about something, we need to not feed their fire. We need to squirt some water on them. What's water? The Word. What's water? The river, the Holy Spirit. So we need to, we need to say, wait a minute, the Scripture tells us this. That if someone curses you, what, tell me, then we should bless them. Then why we don't do that? Why we don't do that? We we need to bless them. If someone talks about you and it gets back to you that they were talking about you, what does the Bible say to do? Well, if someone slaps you, turn the other cheek. And you can use that in that reference. But... But it says, don't take it to heart, because you know you talked about people too. (laughs) That's what the Bible says, Ecclesiastes. Don't take it to heart, you know. Don't take it personal. That person is where they are. Pray for them. You see them, give them a big hug. Tell them you love them. Well, my emotions are telling them I want to slap them. (laughs) Tell your emotions to shut up. That's what it means to crucify the flesh. Yet in Christianity today, you are told or people are told that you should not deny your emotions. Really? The Bible says that's exactly what you have to do is deny your emotions. That's actually the the literal meaning of what it means to crucify the flesh. It's to say these emotions are wrong emotions. Therefore, I will not do what these emotions tell me to do. I will do what God says to do, even if I'm gritting my teeth while I'm doing it. Because what I have found is when you do what God says to do, regardless of how you feel about it, eventually your feelings will fall in line. And then after you do the right thing, you do feel a lot better about yourself. Amen? Because instead of acting like the sons of Satan... We're acting like the sons of God, sons and daughters of God. And that's how God wants us acting. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Guys, this idea that as a Christian, everyone's going to like you is nonsense. Listen, Jesus actually said this. Look, if they didn't like me, and I'm the best they gets. (laughs) <laughs> they're not going to like you. And so instead of getting all sad and upset about it, realize that, wait a minute, man, I'm going to be rewarded by God. It actually says if you're working a job and your boss is not good to you, it says if you would do the right thing and, and give your best to that job, give your best to that boss, It says that the Lord himself will come in and give you favor above everyone else. 
So the next time someone's doing you wrong on your job, instead of complaining about it, go, woohoo, they're about to give me some favor. I'm about to get favor from this person because God is going to come in and see what's going on and he's going to give me favor from it because God is the one that can do that. Can I get an amen? Amen. Leave it in his hands. Do we really trust him? Because it really boils down to, do I really trust the things of God, the teachings coming from the mountain of God? Do I trust these things to be the best thing for my life? And I'm here to tell you they are. Because I've had times when I've not done what this says, and it don't turn out good. So we got to learn to look at these Beatitudes and have the attitude to be like a Christian like this. Amen? Now watch this. So then he kind of goes further in this. He says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you on social media falsely say all kinds of evil against you on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and I don't know, all the other stuff that's out there, you know? And so instead of getting upset, I actually had someone came to me the other day and uh, we were, uh, that's when we were fighting the whole Kratom thing and, and just fighting against that to get it Illegal in our parish, which passed. Can I get an amen? Let's get a Lord of Thank God. But I got absolutely rolled up on the social media. People calling me this and that and this. And, and people were like, oh, are you okay? And I'd be like, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I laugh. I actually laugh about it. Why? Because the Lord says rejoice and be glad. Because just as they have persecuted those before you, listen, more than likely, if you're not getting persecuted, you're probably not standing up for anything. Matter of fact, Paul in Timothy, he says, here's the deal. Every person, every person who desires to live godly shall, not might, shall suffer persecution. Guys, we're not going to live like Christians and fit in the world. We're not supposed to fit in the world. We're supposed to fit in the kingdom. And that's where God desires for us to be. He says, rejoice and be glad. Watch this. For your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Wow. So he says, rejoice and be glad. Your reward Again, we're rewarded. So if anyone's listening out there, blow me up some more. How about it? I mean, just chew on me all you want. Because the more you do, the more my Father rewards me. And I will bless you in return. I will thank God for you in return. Thank you, God, for that cussing out. Woo! Bless that person, God. Because I know the Lord will handle all that. The Lord is going to do for me a reward where it matters most in heaven. That's what matters most. Why? So when I get to heaven, I got some stuff to lay at his feet. I've got some stuff to go lay down at God's feet. Guys, this is the scriptures. This is, this is what Jesus taught. I know it's not what many of us were taught, but this is what Jesus teaches. And when we live the blessed life, it is amazing. It's a bliss. It's, it's the way we are. To live. It's a good life. That time I'm, well, you know, I'm living a good life. I'm living a good life. He goes on in Matthew 5, 13. It says, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by the people and so man we can't one day speak with seasoned tongues and then the next day speak with northern tongues (laughs) sorry charity i'll just pick it you cook amazing speak with 
unseasoned tongues. Because when you go into scripture, it says, let our, all of our words be seasoned with salt. Because then when you start speaking with unseasoned tongues and you get upset because you're getting trampled by people. Hmm. But when you speak with seasoned tongues, then we're going to be useful to God. And that season makes things better. That kind of goes back to being a peacemaker. You know, as Christians, we should make our job better. We should make our home better. We should make our marriage better. We should make our kids better. We should make each other better. Because we don't speak foolishness. Because how can fresh water and salt water come out of the same hole? The answer is it can't. It's an oxymoron. It shouldn't be that way. So we need to strive as hard as we can to speak positive, to speak life. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So we need to speak life to everything and everyone around us if we want to live the blessed life. Then he said, you're the light of the world. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So God does not want us, to, this whole added you know, when it comes to religion, you need to keep that private. That's not what God said. He says this needs to be as public as public gets. We need to come out of the closet. We go in the closet to get close to God. But we come out of the closet to get other people close to God. Can I get an amen? amen. And so we, they need to see they need to see the works, not so that we can get praise, but so that the Father in heaven can be praised. And then you have the scripture that in the same Sermon on the Mount, when he says, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. What he's talking about is your intentions. Yet here he's saying, let people see your good works so they can glorify the Father. It's talking about if you're doing something so you can be seen, whether fasting, whether giving, whether you know, praying, where, where it's all about you being seen, then you lose the reward of it all. But when you're doing it so that the Father can be seen, then you're doing it for the right reason. And by the way, it's the same action. The only difference is what's in here. And here's what we all need to understand. No one knows what's in here in someone else. We need to quit judging other people's intentions because there's no way you can know their intentions. The only one that can know their intentions is God and sometimes them. Sometimes. Sometimes I think I've got great intentions and then the Lord shows me different. But no one else. Sometimes people say my intentions are bad and they have no clue that they're as pure as Christ himself. Because only God can know that. We take people at their word and we leave it go. And we let that between God and them. Amen? So, but we glorify. So, man, why would we show God moving in, in you know, Africa or, you know, serving the widows or doing a different thing? Because we want people to know that God is moving. Why do we show messages on, on uh, Facebook and, and YouTube and all that? Because we want God, we want people to know who God is. We want him to, we want you to experience the Lord. So it's important that we understand this. Be attitudes. Let's have the attitude to be the Christian that God called us to be. Let's live the blessed life. Let's be different. Come on, stand your feet, everyone in here. Team, come on up here. We're going to close in a song. And let me tell you something. 
I did not always know this. I was blind and I was deaf. But now I see and now I hear. And because I see and because I hear, I need to act differently than when I was blind and when I was deaf. I was dead, but now I am alive. Because through the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is the same power that is here to raise us up from this body of sin and death, from this worldly mindset, so that we all would have the mind of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Can we declare this with our mouth today? Come on, who was there before? Who was there before? Who carried that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Oh, until we met who? Till I met you. I was breathing, but not. Listen to this, listen to this. It was my tune till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my Check this out. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew, oh, Jesus, when I met you. Say it, say it. You Break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the end that I'm breathing. I have a future. My eyes are open. Cause when you call me. Oh, yes. 
thank you so much for watching. Please like this video, comment if there's anything on your heart that you would like to share with the community. And be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications so that you can be alerted every time we upload something new. You be blessed.